So these are the two different setups that you can use. So on the left-hand side is my conventional radial setup. I flip my patient 180 degrees. Uh, you can see the arm out. You can do this for distal as well if you want. But the other good option is if, for example, you cannot flip your patient in your room uh, and you cannot get a setup like this in your room with good radiation protection, uh, you can bring the left arm across the patient's body and puncture as though you're puncturing the right common femoral artery. And so it, it, it essentially turns this case into a setup like you would do for femoral access. So for many centers, this is a really good option. Uh, the only thing I'd caution you against is if you're doing a Y90 admin, you've got to make sure that all your equipment can reach uh, when you're um, setting up your box. So for Y90 admins, I don't tend to use the crossbody as much, especially in bigger patients where the arm just doesn't come across the abdomen enough. And some of the benefits here, so if you're accessing and the arms across the bottom of the body, for example, you can use the left radial artery as an access site, for example, if you're doing a thoracic stent graft and it's difficult to get a pigtail up uh, alongside your stent graft, you can just go from the left or to the right radial if need be. This is a, an image that we, we published uh, of one of my fellows actually accessing a trauma patient. This is our neuro room where we have no option to revert to flip the patient. So we have to puncture on the patient's right side. And so crossbody radial really is the only option if we want radiation protection. And you can see here, this is the same patient and he embolized that uh, um, really traumatized splenic artery quite easily with a crossbody technique. And so this is the room set up for conventional radial access and then for distal radial access. This is a video just showing uh, the setup. So uh, for those of you who have, have listened to me talk before, I tend to put a glove on the hand. I prep all the way up to the axilla. I put a tegaderm over the bottom of the glove. And this is just to stop the, the bleeding under the glove and having to clean the, the hand at the end of the procedure, which is a little bit bothersome. Uh, you can do cone beam CT because you can bring the arm easily across the abdomen if you're not doing cross body. Um, and then this is the uh, puncture. So when you're puncturing, as you can see, and we'll go through the step by step, but you want to do a really good thorough assessment of your puncture site. Uh, you can see here I'm puncturing over the trapezium or scaphoid. It's much more proximal than you think. And you can see my needle is at about 60 degrees. And then I'll, I'll, just, I'll just kind of push that needle down a little bit. And you see I'm angling it uh, kind of away from the radial site to allow that wire to to be uh, advanced quite easily. I use a stainless steel wire uh, for my radial access. And so this is another good learning point, but uh, when you're using a, a radial access kit, you wanna use a much stiffer wire than you would for potentially a conventional access because the stiffer wire just allows you to advance your sheath over. Because again, you, you don't need to make a skin incision just like conventional access. This is a merit uh, prelude ideal sheath really well tapered, but the nice thing with the sheath is that you can get a stainless steel wire with it. And then once I've got my sheath in, I'll cover that with a tegaderm to prevent it from slipping out. This is just uh, my radial cocktail, so I dilute this as I would with conventional access with blood to decrease the pain. I then uh, in inject that over 30 seconds and um, I flush out the sheath with uh, saline. And then I put a tegaderm over that sheath because otherwise it will slip out because there's no subcutaneous tissue. And then I make a little nick in that tegaderm to allow the catheter to be uh, pushed through. And again, you want to identify your extended extensive tendons and absolutely do not puncture through those tendons because it can be absolutely devastating for the patient. It's painful. They can have long-term sequelae from that. They can get tenosynovitis. Um, and once you, at this point in the case, once you've gotten your sheath in and your wires tracking, the case is no different to conventional radial access. I'm not going through anything else except access uh, in this talk. Uh, one of the things I'll talk about later is the difference in size, but essentially there is no difference in size. Uh, you can see here, this is a same patient, uh, distal radial artery, uh, 0.27 and conventional 0.28. Uh, and, and as we go through the, uh, the landmarks, you can see we'll start very distal in the interosseous muscles. You can see some of the thena muscles as well. You move more proximal to the base of the metacarpals. You don't really want to puncture here because you can see you can easily puncture between the metacarpal heads. You can see there's the, the base of the thumb metacarpal. Like it can be very osteoarthritic, particularly in postmenopausal females. And so you want to puncture over the trapezium with a scaphoid where the bone is much, much flatter. Uh, and you can see here, yeah, this is just ultrasound Doppler showing, uh, you know, that artery moving over the distal radius and down 
into onto the voter side of the wrist. And so we're going to go through this uh, step by step in terms of the landmarks and what to look for. Um, just to let you know, and I'll show you the reference in a second, this has all been published in a paper, so you can download this, it's free in Euro intervention, uh, just to have as a reference. So you can see there's the first web space, the artery is very, very deep, there's no bone underneath that artery to support you for hemostasis, so avoid puncturing here. It's quite easy to palpate the artery here, so a lot of uh, operators who don't use ultrasound will tend to puncture here. Uh, as opposed to more proximal. This is the base of the metacarpals. Again, avoid puncturing here. It's the trapezium. <clears throat> and he has the scaphoid. And you can see here, I've got local anesthetic in already. And, and this is a good point to puncture because you're puncturing over that scaphoid. So you often are a lot more proximal uh, than you think you are when you just look at the hand. The slap box is a very proximal structure. And so you just got to get used to that. And the reason that you need to puncture more proximal than distal is because you want to avoid this situation, which is a hand hematoma. The hand has significant compartments, so there's at least 10 of them. And so if you cause a hand hematoma, this patient develops compartment syndrome, the hand surgeon has to decompress a number of individual compartments that are separated by a very, very uh, thick non-compliant fascia. This is uh, a case of a hand hematoma published in, um, uh, in November 2020, you can see actually the puncture side is, is, is probably okay. It looks like it's quite proximal, but it, it's probably an issue with hemostasis post uh, that caused this hand hematoma. Or it could also be um, complications during access, difficulty getting access where you bleed. Uh, and then once you get access, you know, you've got some blood uh, in that soft tissue. And again, this is not like the conventional radial access side. You don't have as much forgiveness in terms of hematomas like you do uh, in the wrist. So just again, access, uh, you can do this under ultrasound. I think it's better to do it under ultrasound. So I'll inject local anesthetic under ultrasound guidance, about two to three mLs into that snuff box. You wanna try and do a single wall punch if you can. You don't have to do a, you know, inject a huge amount of uh, local anesthesia, you can, but it does tend to move the artery sometimes. And so I do about two to three mLs. I don't nick the skin. This is a personal preference. You can, if you want but be very, very careful because you're even more superficial than you are in the wrist. Uh, so be careful when you nick the skin. Use a stiffer wire. I use an 018 uh, stainless steel wire. You can use an 021, but I would definitely stay away from spring coiled wires if you can, because you just don't have the same degree of support that you have uh, with um, a stainless steel wire. This is the Prelude Ideal. This is the one that I use. It has a really good transition. Taruma has the slender. The nice thing with the ideal is it's a flat braided sheath, which means that it's much less prone to kinking. And again, in a snuff box, because of the angles, you can um, have the sheath kinking. So be very, very careful. So this is why I use the uh, Prelude Ideal. So once you have access, you insert your stainless steel wire, insert your sheath, cover it with a translucent dressing and make a nick. Uh, and then hemostasis, I use the Statil. It's a, a little hemostatic disc made by BioLife, which is a company in Sarasota in Florida. I put this on and I have a hemostasis protocol, which I'll show you in a second. Uh, it's 10 minutes. Uh, we've got a lot of data on this. Uh, the patients do really well. You have options for hemostatic devices. These are the two that I use. Um, the white one is um, the uh, safeguard radial. And the reason I like this is because it's sticky and because it's a funny shape that you're dealing with. If you use any uh, bands for conventional access, you, you kind of have to modify them. Whereas with this one, it's sticky, it stays in position, it doesn't move, it's got a small 7 ml balloon. The other option is the one at the bottom right, which is the uh, Prelude Sync. Uh, and this is specifically made for distal access. So uh, with hemostasis, it's faster than conventional radial access. You can or cannot use a stat seal, it's up to you, I do. The safeguard is conformable and sticky, so it's good to use, or you can use the, uh, the Prelude Sync. Um, but you cannot perform patent hemostasis because you're puncturing uh, distal to that superficial palmar branch. Um.